Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, my name is uh, Suyang. I'm from Professor uh, Zahia Sounds Group uh, in the Physics Department of Princeton University. So today I'm going to tell you about our theory and experimental discovery of the first uh, wild sedimental state and uh, the associated uh, topological fermions in this compound tantum arsenal. Okay, let me start by thanking all the uh, team members. So our RPS team uh, at Princeton is led by Professor uh, Zahia Song, and then uh, we collaborate with uh, various groups for uh, various uh, projects. For this wild sedimental project, we mainly collaborate with Professor Jia's group in Peking University, and also with Professor Cho's group in Taiwan. And also, uh, none of the works will be uh, possible without all the helpful uh, uh, assistance uh, at the beam lines of the work. Okay, so uh, topological insulators 3D was discovered in 2000, uh, around 2007 and 2008, and this is really uh, well known now that uh, on the surface it has this Dirac uh, fermions, which are basically you know, uh, uh, spin momentum locked uh, Dirac particles. Uh, and now, in quantum field theory, we know that there are uh, an, 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 another two types of uh, fundamental fermions, mass leaks. One is a uh, Majorana fermion, the other one is a uh, Weyl fermion. And then uh, the two of the truly exciting new frontiers that emerge from topological insulators uh, are uh, to search for Majorana fermions and to search for Weyl fermions. And the first one is uh, linked to uh, find a topological superconductor, and the second one is uh, linked to, to find a topological wild sediment. So today I'm going to focus on the second part, about the wild part. So here I'm just listing some of the useful reviews. For topological insulators, there has been many, and then for wild sedimentals, uh, there has been only theory reviews. For example, here is a review by Wolfack and uh, uh, we should not. Okay, so one slide about topological insulators. So uh, this is, uh, for example, the most well-known one, Bittman Stalinite and uh, Bittman Stalinite. It has this spin momentum locking. Uh, yeah, and on the surface, it realizes a very phase of pi, and that corresponds to the uh, invariant uh, in the bomb, uh, the mu naught equals one. Yeah, so this has this metallic surface states on all surfaces. So one recent uh, advance that I want to point out is that in collaboration with uh, the, uh, Professor Chen's group in Purdue, we now uh, discovered a, a, a compound. This is bismuth and timony tellurium selenium. And this compound, in contrast to the previous TIs, uh, the, the, the difference is that now it's really bulk insulating. And the surface also has a high enough mobility so that we can see very well-defined uh, plateaus that arise from the quantum Hall states, from the topological surface states. So now this means that the sample, this sample BSTS is really in the topological transport uh, regime, and one can really test the device uh, uh, applications for the 3D TIs using this sample. Okay, so now let's go to our topic. So we know that uh, in topological insulators, uh, it's defined by the topological number, like the mu naught z2 uh, number, and that number fundamentally requires the bulk has a full insulating gap. But then we want to ask the question, can metals also be topological? Know that in the metals, the bulk will not have a full gap. So then the question is that, how do we define a topological number for a, for a metal if it's topological? And what would be the surface states that uh, corresponds to a uh, topological number? Uh, metal. And uh, it turns out that the, 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 the answer is this so-called well sand metal, where the, the quasi particle excitations of the bulk obeys the well equation. So well fermions was uh, proposed by a gentleman, Herman Weil, in 1929. And what he discovered is that uh, uh, if you take the 4 by 4 Dirac equation and then take the mass term to zero, and it's sort of reduced to a two by two equation, which is uh, what we saw about uh, wow well equation now. And then solving that wow well equation will give you a two by two massless uh, fermionic particle that has a definite uh, chirality, either left hand or right hand. So that uh, 
uh, basically that is the wild, uh, uh, wild fermion particle. So what I want to point out is uh, uh, wild fermions play a very important role in, uh, in particle physics, uh, like a standard model, but it has never been observed as a fundamental particle uh, in particle physics. And therefore now, the wild set metals in common matter actually provide the first ever realization of wild fermions in all of physics, and it has many uh, exciting properties that I don't have time to cover all of them, but I just want to highlight that in contrast to a topological insulator, where only the surface states, the direct surface states are, you know, are a desired thing, are, are interesting, and one wants to get rid of the bulk. Here in a well sand metal, uh, both the surface and the bulk are interesting. So uh, in the bulk, we have the well fermions, and on the surface, there are these uh, Fermi arc surface states. So therefore, this really opens up a whole lot of research uh, opportunities for both uh, box sensitive uh, probes in experiments such as transport and also surface uh, uh, sensitive probes such as RPS and SDM. Okay, so then the question is we know that the uh, well, well sentimentals are very interesting, but then how do we find a well sentimental? So this links back to a, 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 an earlier work uh, uh, which we did, I think, in 2011 which is to realize a topological phase transition in a topological uh, insulator and that gives rise to the 3, 3D Dirac cemental. So basically what we know is if we take a 3D Dirac fermion and if we, in, uh, on a lattice, and if we break either inversion symmetry or tiberosal symmetry of the system then the Dirac node will split into a pair or multiple pairs of uh, wild nodes that have uh, uh, you know, each pair has opposite uh, chiralities. So that will give rise to a wild sand metal. Uh, so then, in 2011, we have realized this uh, topological phase transition from a uh, 3D topological insulator to a tribute insulator. So this is done in this fine business selenium sulfur system by basically uh, changing the composition of 100% selenium 100% sulfur, and this effectively changes the spinor decoupling, and then you know at a critical composition, then the bond bands touch each other, form a 3D Dirac semi-metal. And in this case, it happens to be around 50-50%. Okay, so now now if we take this uh, critical composition and then this Dirac semi-metal, and then if we really break the uh, inversion symmetry or the time versus symmetry of this starting Difference uh, system, then we will get a we will get a well symmetric state. But then uh, at that time we found out that uh, for this particular system breaking either symmetry is experimentally very hard. So, but this at, at least uh, you know demonstrate the spirit or the, the methodology. So then let, let me talk talk about some of the theoretical proposals before our work. So uh, the first uh, uh, well symmetric material. Uh, 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 proposal. It's done by uh, one Turner, Vishwanath, and uh, collaborators. Uh, this is in 2011. They found that in certain irradiate, where uh, there's, uh, if they assume some sort of a, a magnetic ordering, then it, they, will, uh, they predict that there, there will be a T-breaking Wilson metal uh, phase. Uh, similarly, uh, later on that year, Burkhoff and Balance proposed that uh, if you consider a super lattice uh, consisting of uh, multi-layers of uh, topological insulators and normal insulators uh, where you have to fine train the parameter to the critical point and then develop a magnetic ordering this will also give you a, a well segmental state and uh, later on in the same year uh, I think this is from the IOP group they proposed this is a stoichiometric compound mercury chromium selenide and it is indeed a deferment in, in experiment and they propose that this can also give rise to a wild sentimental state. So uh, we have tried these samples very extensively when they were proposed, except especially this one where the mercury one where we can find large single crystals. I remember that uh, my colleague and I used to keep a lot of samples uh, at even one beam time, just try to see if we can see any RPS bad structure that it's uh, you know 
uh, that, is, that you show the biosegment state, but we couldn't find anything that is uh, close there. So uh, later on, we, we, we realized that uh, uh, why that uh, the key breaking biosegments are so hard. For example, for this mercury compound, this is a cubic uh, compound. So that really means that uh, you know in the magnetic magnetic uh, phase, the A and B and C are equivalent. So then you would form many magnetic domains, and know that in our case you cannot uh, add a, a magnetic field to align the magnetic domains. So then you have many, many domains, and then your RPA spectrum will be averaged out. And the, the other problem is that uh, in calculation, actually, uh, the band crossing is between mercury S orbital and selenium P orbital, but then when you add a band gap correction, then the, the, uh, the band inversion is actually removed. So similarly, the other two proposals has uh, have many, uh, uh, you know, in the experiments they have uh, many problems. For example, in the irradiated case, even the magnetic ordering itself they use uh, in experiments is under debate. And then for the also the, the crystals are extremely small and they're hard to grow. And for the for the multi-layer case, obviously you require a very fine tuning to the critical point, and you also you also you have to develop a magnetic ordering in these non-magnetic uh, uh, compounds, which are very hard. Okay, so then key breaking is hard. Then we were wondering, what about uh, breaking inversion symmetry? So I just want to point out that before our work, there, there, there was a uh, proposal uh, by the Vanderbilt, uh, Vanderbilt School. They proposed that in this rare earth, infamous antimony tellurium compound, and if you uh, sort of calculate the band structure, there's a very fine region between uh, below 5% uh, region, and there will be uh, a well segmental uh, phase uh, if they use a crystal structure that breaks inversion symmetry. But then what we found out is that uh, the crystal structure they're using is actually, actually hypothetic, and uh, our sample growers told us that uh, in reality it's extremely hard to actually grow the crystals in that desired uh, crystal structure is lengthy, and also this uh, you see that it requires very fine tuning. Only within five percent, it, it will have a very small region. It will have a one centimeter state. So this is hard. But then I want to point out a, a, a very a, a completely unrelated but uh, sort of uh, another important fact. So here I'm pointing out a truly. Uh, experimental data on uh, immersion breaking single crystal, but this is nothing wild. This is just uh, you know uh, a trivial band insulator, bismuth tellurium iodide. But then it has this simple ABC ABC stacking that breaks the immersion symmetry. So uh, so now here is the RPS data, and we see this beautiful uh, rush bar band uh, bands from the bulk. And this is our data, but it's, this, this sample is also studied by many other RPS groups. And what this tells us, we know that the RPS beam spot is quite large. And the fact that we see this beautiful band, it must mean that uh, the domain size of the inversion eye-breaking crystals, at least in certain cases, it can be large enough. And we don't have to align them by a magnetic field. They're just as grown. So then they're large enough so that the RPS can be done. So now, and to show that they're immersion breaking, obviously. So now, uh, uh, so this really, you know, gives us a lot of confidence. Now that uh, we know that the immersion breaking uh, single crystals are more, you know, feasible in experiments. Now we just need a robust candidate for a wild sand method. So then the question boils down to how do we find a immersion breaking wild sand metal candidate? And then if you uh, look on the crystallographic uh, uh, library or database, you find that even for immersion breaking uh, single crystal, there are so many. There are like uh, tens of thousands of single uh, crystals that are immersion breaking. So then we have to find out which ones are well segmental. Uh, so then, uh, so then we we did we yeah we, we started to search that by ourselves, and then we developed a systematic systematic uh, methodology to to you know look at all these large number of compounds to find out which ones are biosegmentals. And uh, it turns out the first successful case was this uh, tantrum arsenic 1-1 binary case. 
And we found that uh, this is the, the, uh, a emergent breaking Wilson metal. And our paper was submitted in uh, 2014, November, and then was uh, now published on Nature Communication this year. And uh, 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 it happens that uh, uh, around the same similar time, the IOP group also found in theory that uh, this tantalum arsenide is an uh, emergent breaking Wilson metal around a very similar time. Uh, and uh, what I want to say is because now we have this method to find emergent breaking Wilson metals, we have found many more. Uh, for example, uh, one of the compounds that we made public is this uh, strontium silicide. And uh, we found that this is even more exciting because it has this quadratic wild fermions, which means that the wild fermions have quadratic dispersion and has a uh, uh, plus minus two chiral charge, a higher chiral charge. And then uh, we have found even more, and uh, we're going to make them public uh, soon. Okay, so here it's just pointing out that uh, you know, this paper is now published and it was submitted in 2014. So now, okay, so let me talk about the theory part, uh, class being a well metal. So the crystal structure of tantalum arsenide is tetragonal, and then if you look along the 001 direction, each, uh, each layer consists of only one type of atom, and they form a square at lattice. But then they uh, stack in a way that the crystal itself breaks in virgin symmetry, as you can uh, clearly see from this unit cell. And now, when you calculate the uh, band structure, even along the, just simply along the high symmetry axis, you see that along this sigma and sigma 1, uh, there is a quite robust uh, band crossing uh, between the conduction and valence band, uh, about 0.5 dB. Uh, and then when you add spherical recoupling, you see that the band crossings are gapped out uh, along the high symmetry axis. So now uh, we need to find whether there are well points or not. I just want to point out that without any special symmetry reasons, uh, the well points are usually uh, not along any uh, high symmetry axis or rotational axis or not at any Kramer's point or high symmetry points. They're usually at some uh, you know, arbitrary points within the BZ. So that means we really have to calculate the, the band structure throughout the first Brouillard zone to find out whether they are well nodes or not. So here is the answer for tantalum arsenide. Without spin orbit coupling, as I mentioned, there, there's already band crossing along the high symmetry axis. And uh, if we calculate the full BZ, we find that without spin orbit coupling, the band crossings are actually one dimensional. So that means the conduction band and valence band dip, in, dip into each other and they form this one dimensional kind of like a ring like touching. And in the first BZ, there are four of them. They're on the kx equals zero and ky equals zero mirror planes. And then when I add the spin on the coupling, uh, the, the nodal lines themselves are gapped out. But then if I go slightly away from the nodal lines, I find uh, point-like touchings. And then if I count, uh, in total, there are 24 wild nodes. These are the wild nodes. And there, in total, there are 24 of them in tantalum arsenide. And uh, uh, so we named the, 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 the wild nodes that are on this case equals 2 pi new plane as W1. And then the, there are eight of them. And then the other 16 that are away from this plane as W2. Okay, so we can actually also calculate the, the, the distribution of the very flux, uh, like in the vicinity of the uh, two of the wild nodes, we see that one uh, serves as, uh, they really uh, behave like monopoles of, and uh, anti-monopoles of the very flux. Okay, so now I just want to uh, summarize uh, all the important works, uh, 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 pioneer works uh, in this subject. For the theoretical prediction, we have uh, this is uh, sorted in the order of the submission date. So in the theoretical prediction, our work was submitted in 2014 and then published in 2015. And then in the uh, experimental, uh, 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 sorry, and then there's an IOP uh, theory paper. And then in the RPES experimental work, our paper was um, now published in Science in uh, July, and it was posted and submitted in February. And there are also uh, later works, including our, our own group, which uh, uh, 
study either task or related components. OK. 